All right, guys, this is Moss again. Going to try to finish up the 60s with this installment. We talked about in the 1968 election, um, kind of an unprecedented uh, situation in the Democratic Party. You have the, the candidate, Eugene McCarthy, oppose his own party's president, setting president, the incumbent, Lyndon B. Johnson, over the, the war in Vietnam. And so I don't think McCarthy could have beat Lyndon Johnson, um, but it just shows you that, that definitely there's a lot of sentiment against the Vietnam War, and, and it's lost its support after four years of still no end in sight. And so you start to see a really a real anti-LBJ uh, sentiment in the United States. Uh, it's anti-war, it's counterculture, but it's also anti-LBJ. Um, and uh, one of the things I want to I want to point back to this. This is a very poignant button up here in the in the top left. You have to be 21 in order to vote at this time. Uh, you are 18 when you're drafted, but you can't vote for the guy who's going to send you to war in Vietnam for another several years until you're 21. And so you can drink at 18, you can smoke at 18, you can graduate high school, you can be drafted, but you can't vote. And so that's that's a very interesting political um, undertone that's going on during the Vietnam War. Um, and again, Lyndon Johnson feels this, and um, he's he's constantly getting protested. This is his uh, limousine being egged and and um, ridiculed on its way back to the White House. And so, when a member of his own party, his his arch nemesis Robert Kennedy who is senator at the time for New York, when Bobby Kennedy announces that he's going to also run against Lyndon Johnson, I think that LBJ really sees the writing on the wall, so to speak, and he decides uh, he's out. And so Lyndon, Lyndon Johnson decides he's not going to run for re-election. Uh, in the meantime, like we said, Bobby Kennedy was, was gaining support with uh, Cesar Chavez and the migrant workers. Um, he was gaining support in, in a lot of the minority areas around the country, the younger voter uh, population. And so LBJ decides he's not going to run for re-election in 68. Um, and then we saw Kennedy uh, really picking up momentum against McCarthy um, when Martin Luther King Jr. Is, is cut down in Memphis, Tennessee at the Lorraine Motel by James Earl Ray. Um, and then what you see after that is Bobby Kennedy winning the primary in California for the Democrats only to be assassinated by Sirhan Sirhan. And, uh, and this just absolutely dashes, it, it really snuffs out a lot of the hope in America at this time. And so, again, we have this playing out. And so now a lot of people are really plagued with what happens next. Um, by the way, I'm going to introduce you. This is younger brother Edward Kennedy. This is Ted Kennedy. He really takes on the mantle of, of basically becoming father to all these, these orphan kids. Not necessarily orphan because their moms are still alive, but Bobby Kennedy's kids. He had a ton of kids. Uh, John F. Kennedy's two children. Uh, they all look to Uncle Edward, Ted, as as their surrogate dad. And so he really takes the brunt of, of having to raise all these kids and also be a senator himself. And so we're going to get into uh, Ted Kennedy later on. Uh, but the, the 1968 Democratic Convention is a contentious one. Um, the Democrats don't know who who to run. And so this is where you have a lot of protests, anti-war, counterculture protests against the Democratic Party because they see it as LBJ's party and LBJ is the one keeping the Vietnam War going. And so there's a lot of sentiment against the Democratic Party there in Chicago at the Democratic uh, Convention uh, outside. And and it gets very, very brutal to the point to where the mayor of Chicago, a guy named Daly, brings in the National Guard, brings in um, the, the Chicago police, and they crack down, literally crack down on the protesters, and to the point to where uh, they're they're just busting people in the face with nightsticks, arresting whoever they can. It, it gets very brutal, and this is this is playing out on the streets of America, right? This isn't supposed to happen in the United States. Um, out of the Democratic Convention, you have the Vice President under LBJ, Hubert H. Humphrey, the original Triple H. He is going to emerge as the candidate. 
And it's this is not a strong candidate in 1968. People see Hubert H. Humphrey as just a continuation of LBJ's policies. So if you don't like LBJ, why would you like Humphrey? And so this is going to really open it up for whoever the Republicans run. Well, in 1968, the Republicans run again Richard Nixon. So Richard Milhouse Nixon is going to run. And uh, if you look here, this is in 1968. Um, Kansas votes for Nixon, goes Republican, and never turns back. And that is who's going to win the 68 election, Richard Nixon. Nixon's vice president is Spiro Agnew from Maryland. And you're going to... Um, <laughs> You're going to get to know Spiro Agnew just a little bit here in, uh, in the next uh, 1970s unit. Um, in, the 1960, in the 1960s, to finish out 68, 69, people are very disillusioned with the Vietnam War. And one of the things that plays out is one of the skeletons in our, in our national closet. This is the My Lai Massacre. And I, I really encourage you to look into this. This is where Americans go wrong. Um, you have a about a 15 to 20 member unit of what's called Charlie Company going into this uh, this village that we called Pinkville but was known as Me Lai and looking for bad guys and when we don't find any Viet Cong a lieutenant William Cowley orders the basically just wholesale murder of um several of these villagers and um, it's just absolutely unbecoming of an American soldier. And so I encourage you to look into the My Lai Massacre. Um, I would also encourage you to really study up on Hugh Thompson Jr. This is one of my personal heroes. This is a helicopter pilot that saw this massacre of over 500 um, villagers, you know, innocent villagers down below, and decided to put a stop to it and put himself in harm's way to, to stop it. Um, but when this becomes public, this is this is crucial and just fodder for the anti-war sentiment. Um, Americans are not supposed to act like this. This is this is up there with the Nazis, and so um, I would encourage you to look at the My Lai massacre. Um, another thing that uh, we we continue on with the '60s is our space race. Um, Kennedy, while he was still alive at Rice University, he was given a commencement speech and he, uh, he said that uh, we choose to go to the moon. Um, that was the next benchmark in the space race. The, the Soviet cosmonauts had basically beat us at every benchmark up to that. And so we really had to get the end goal of getting a man on the moon. And so if you'll remember, we talked about the uh, SS scientist Werner von Braun, rocket man, right? Um, he had... He had surrendered to the U.S. at the closing of World War II, and we put him and his scientists to work at NASA. And they are going to develop, you know, the same guy that's, that's developing rockets for Hitler later on is going to be developing missiles for us, but then later on Saturn uh, rockets that are going to get us to the moon. And so Werner von Braun, uh, again, like we said, goes to work for NASA. He even does a special for Disney go figure. Um, and he is going to develop the Saturn rocket that is going to propel the Apollo 11 mission. And so Apollo 11 is, is what we refer to as moonshot. Um, up to this point, we had had um, previous Apollo missions, one through 10, obviously, that were just trying to explore different parts of in the phases of, of what would finally land men on the moon. And so this is the crew of the Apollo 11 uh, that was launched in July of 1969. Uh, over on your left, you have the uh, commander, Neil Armstrong. You have then in the middle, Michael Collins, and then Buzz Aldrin. And this is the Saturn V rocket that's going to get them there. Um, they are going to be part of what's called the Columbia. This is the... Um, the Columbia module is going to go around the moon and use it as uh, the gravitational pull of the moon to slingshot us back to, to Earth. And so Michael Collins will stay in the Columbia module. And the other two, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, will get into the Eagle lunar, lunar uh, lander and depart from the Columbia and actually land on the surface of the moon. And then 
will jettison off the moon when their mission's complete, join Redock with Collins uh, as he's slingshotting around the moon and getting to Earth. So Collins, at one point, is the loneliest man in, in our galaxy. Uh, he is on the dark side of the moon uh, by himself. I can't even imagine. So, um, And Neil Armstrong is going to be the first man on the moon. Now, there's a lot of conspiracy theories that we didn't actually do this. I don't believe that for one minute. Um, those have all been debunked. Um, if you want to reach out to me, I'd, I'd love to explain all these to you um, personally. Um, if you have a chance, look at Mythbusters. They do an entire segment on this, but we landed on the moon. If no, for no other reason, the Soviets were watching us so closely, and they even they even acknowledge, yes, you landed on the moon. They would have loved to to proven us wrong and, and found us in a conspiracy cover up hoax, but they couldn't do it, and they didn't do it. And yes, we landed on the moon. If for no other reason, um, what you have even today is you have um, apparatus put on the moon by the Apollo 11 mission that we can even bounce laser beams off of. And so, proof that we were there. Um, there's our guys coming back down. I have a piece of the Kapton foil that was used to uh, protect us from re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere in my room if you want to see it when I see you again. Um, and these guys are hailed as absolute heroes. So... There we go. There's the Mythbusters thing there. Um, in the 1960s, you have a, a rash of uh, serial killers. You have the Zodiac. You have the Charles Manson family murders. Um, we're not going to get into that a whole lot, but in uh, Abnormal Psychology, we talk about that. Um, in 1969, uh, we talked about Edward Kennedy, Ted Kennedy. I think he's starting to feel the pressure here. And he's hosting a party, and... This is on Chappaquiddick Island in Massachusetts. They're having this little insider party with all of his old former secretaries and, and associates. And he leaves with this uh, this old secretary, Mary Jo Kopechny, and he's he's been drinking. They run off of the road and they end up in, in the water. Well, he gets out, he swims ashore, but instead of reporting the incident, he sleeps and doesn't report the incident until the next morning when a fisherman has actually spotted the car. Um, divers go down and they pull out Mary Jo Kopechny's body. And it's, it's a huge scandal for Ted Kennedy. Um, he really had aspirations for being president. A lot of people thought he was going to follow in his brother's footsteps. And when his brother Bobby Kennedy had been shot down... Um, on what looked to be a promising candidacy in 68. Uh, they really looked at Ted Kennedy to kind of pick up the mantle and carry on. Well, this is going to this is gonna dash those dreams. And so this becomes the Chattaquiddick um, incident of 1969 that is going to haunt Ted Kennedy for the rest of his life. Now, he will go on to serve continuous terms in, uh, in the Senate. Uh, he constantly keeps getting reelected until the end of his life when he dies of cancer. But um, but this is definitely one of those dark clouds that hangs over his head. Um, also in 1969, you have this, uh, this worldwide phenomena. Uh, Paul McCartney of the Beatles, um, their fame is so abs just absolutely crazy. Um, some American disc jockey uh, quips that in the last album, the White Album, um, it claimed that if you if you play that record backwards on some of the songs, it says that Paul is dead. And it led to this whole rumor thing and this phenomena where everybody believed that Paul had died in a car accident and that they had replaced him with a body double to continue touring on so they wouldn't lose any revenue. And that, that um, John Lennon was trying to tell the fans and... It was just, it's absolutely crazy. So when I see you, when we reconvene in the fall, um, ask me to play you uh, some of the of the Beatles albums backwards, and I'll, I'll show you where they got this from. So, um, You know, the war and the struggle in Vietnam continues. Um, very unpopular war. Um, look up Hamburger Hill. This idea that we had absolutely, our, our leaders told us we absolutely had to take this hill away from the uh, Viet Cong, and we do, and we, we lose all these guys to do it. And yet, after two weeks, 
our leadership decides to abandon the hill and give it back to the Viet Cong. And so it's, it's a microcosm symbolic of the rest of the greater war and the stupidity that's running this war. And again, you support the soldier, but you don't have to necessarily support the leadership um, and the asinine tactics. And so these uh, images play out in several uh, news publications in America um, and in Life magazine. It, it, it depicts you know the struggle of Hamburger Hill um, and several other battles where we've lost so many men for, for what, right? And so it, it's just growing into that sentiment of, against the Vietnam War. Now, into that becomes one of the coolest things in the 1960s to close us out. This is the Woodstock. Um, festival. This is in August of 1969. You have some venture capitalists who decide it, it kind of morphed from basically they wanted to bring in all these different uh, music acts and cut a record out in the woods in some studio. Well, then they decided let's just go ahead and put on a concert. And they were they were slated to do this in New York in uh, in a place called Woodstock, New York. Well, that fell through, and so they were scrambling at the last minute to find somewhere nearby where they could hold it. And finally, they, they ran across this uh, dairy farmer named Max Yasger, who offered up his dairy farm, this huge 600-acre farm, dairy farm in Bethel, New York. So Woodstock did not actually happen in Woodstock. It happened in Bethel, New York. Um, but the flyers were already out, so it became continuously known as, as Woodstock. Uh, but Max Yasger's farm... Um, hosted this three-day weekend event in August of '69, and all of these all of these acts were slated to perform, and they sold. I can't remember how many thousands of of tickets they actually sold, um, but then they finally they had they were counting on maybe a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand people to attend, and it ended up over half a million people attended, uh, maybe six hundred thousand people attended. We're not real sure. And they all converge on this small little town in, in New York, and it's just chaos. Now, the cool thing about this is, is that there was rampant drug use um, that probably calmed everybody down to where there were hardly any fights. Um, everybody got along. There was a shortage of food, but nobody seemed really to matter. They probably had the munchies, but they didn't really, really bother them. Um, there were a couple of deaths by accident, um, overdoses, and somebody got ran over. But there were also a couple of people being born at Woodstock, believe it or not. So your mom's hanging out and she's like, well, I could either go to the hospital or I could go to Woodstock. Hey, go to Woodstock. Good choice, mom. And so um, this is a three-day event where it's just probably the coolest party ever in American history. And um, all these famous bands play. It rained, torrential downpour, but people just kind of went with it and, and just made the best of the situation and, and just had a good time. I wish I could go back and, and see this. Uh, I had a biology teacher in high, school, in high school that said she was at Woodstock and I asked her how it was and she said she couldn't remember. So she quipped that if anybody was at Woodstock, they wouldn't remember. That is a lot of people. So if you have a chance, uh, look up a YouTube video. It's, um, it's called Watch Mojo. And uh, it's uh, about the v or the um, Woodstock Festival. That's a very good documentary. Um, the Vietnam War continues on, and with with that is the push to adopt an amendment that is going to lower the voting age. And you'll see that in 1971, but it hasn't come yet. So we'll talk about that. Um, and so anyway, the war continues on, and uh, very very unpopular. Um, Nixon is now your president, and he had on, he had uh, promised basically a, a, an end to the war, and he hasn't delivered on that yet, and so people are becoming very restless, um, trying to demand that he, he go ahead and finish the war in Vietnam, and he's not going to. He's going to look for something called peace with honor. Uh, he does not want to be the first American president to lose a war, and so you just see this war drag on and on and on. In 1969, Ho Chi Minh dies, um, but that does not stop the Vietnam War. And so, again, you just, you see this thing drag on. Um, there's some cool cultural things that happen. 
And that is the end of the 60s, and I will see you again in the 1970s.